this population. Um, I just have a quick disclaimer. I am, of course, not an expert in this patient population. I've only been here a little over a month, and I've had some experience over my clinical um, rotations during school, but I have reviewed a lot of the literature in depth and um, have spoken to others who are experts, but really this is just meant to start the conversation on how we should be um, intervening with these patients and how we should change the way we approach um, assessment and our discharge recommendations with these folks. So I just wanted to say that up front. Uh, to give you a little background information, so consciousness is a state of being awake and aware of oneself and surroundings through thoughts in the five senses. So a person with a disorders of consciousness has trouble either being awake, aware, or even both. It's estimated that 1.7 million people sustain a traumatic brain injury each year, and of these, 50,000 people die and about 17% of the survivors have a period of complete unconsciousness. So it's a decent amount of um, these folks that sustain a traumatic brain injury that we're working with that have a disorders of consciousness. It does have a pretty um, significant economic impact as well. It's projected that the average per person lifetime cost of care alone for severe TBI ranges from $600,000 to $1,875,000. And then just a note, um, people of disorder, with disorders of consciousness doesn't only include brain injury, it also includes neurological conditions such as stroke, progressive degenerative disorders, tumors, neurometabolic diseases, and congenital and developmental disorders as well. So when we're talking about disorders of consciousness, it encompasses all of those diagnoses. I'm going to kind of fly through this information just because there's a lot of other information I want to share with you, and this is here for your reference, um, just defining the difference between them as they emerge through the levels of consciousness. Um, but as I go through my presentation, I'll point out some key uh, factors that are really indicative, indicative of when they've emerged to the next level of consciousness. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, so starting with differential diagnosis. This is something that um, is really important with this population. We need to be capturing uh, what level of consciousness they are as well as the timeline. So we really need to capture when they've emerged from a coma-like state to a vegetative state and then from a vegetative state to the minimally conscious state as it really um, gives us good information on their functional outcomes or prognosis um, for their functional recovery. So uh, brain injury etiology has been dichotomized into traumatic brain injury and non-traumatic brain injury. The non-traumatic brain injury category includes stroke, anoxic brain injury, infectious, toxics, toxic, and metabolic disorders. So all those fall in the non-traumatic brain injury etiology, which you'll see as we move on is really important to di differentiate the difference between traumatic and non-traumatic brain injury. Um, there has been some recent literature that was published that has changed the way we define persistent vegetative state. So it was previously considered anything one month post-injury, they were still in that vegetative state. And based on this recent literature that was just published this year, they've changed the definition to, um, which for a persistent vegetative state, this implies that further recovery of consciousness is highly unlikely after these intervals. And for non-traumatic brain injury, it's a vegetative state lasting three months after post-injury versus um, a traumatic brain injury, which is lasting 12 months post-injury, um, that they're in a vegetative state. So you'll see that the traumatic brain injury etiology gets that longer time period because they found that they um, have better outcomes even in a prolonged state of vegetative state. So there are various factors that lead to diagnostic, diagnostic instability such as fluctuations in behaviors that distinguish a vegetative state and a minimally conscious state. So if you read through those charts, it really are simple minor things that puts them into that next level of consciousness and so fluctuating behaviors can really make it challenging for correctly diagnosing these folks. Um, some other factors are aphasia and apraxia um, or other neurological conditions or impairments that we see with this patient population. 
when we're looking at predicting what their functional outcome might look like or what their prognosis might look like, there are some key factors that we take into consideration. So for considering their mortality, um, we look at the type of injury. So again, is it traumatic brain injury or non-traumatic brain injury etiology? We look at the injury severity. So say they have a diffuse axonal injury, is it a grade one diffuse axonal versus a grade four, which is really severe uh, diffuse axonal injury? Um, looking at, does it only affect the cortical or more surface structures versus the really deep uh, brain structures um, to determine the severity of the brain injury? And then the next two kind of go hand in hand. So we're looking at the level of consciousness as well as the timing of presentation. So again, capturing really when they're emerging from that coma-like state into a vegetative state and then hopefully onto a minimally conscious state because that is really telling of uh, mortality as well as their uh, prognosis overall. And then just noting that mortality rates are high for patients with a prolonged disorders of consciousness. When we're looking at predicting prognosis, we again look at level of consciousness as well as the time post-injury. That's really, with this new literature that's been published, this is really telling of what their functional outcome might be long term. Uh, so this just says detecting consciousness and discerning the level of awareness is really helpful for us in when we're formulating our um, prognosis for these individuals. So as I've alluded to, emerging information on long-term outcomes of patients with prolonged disorders of consciousness suggests that long-held beliefs of poor outcomes for this patient population are incorrect. So they did a five-year outcome study of individuals that were in a prolonged vegetative state, and then now this year they published a 10-year outcome study of that same patient sample, um, and they showed that there actually is a good probability of um, positive outcomes which is opposite of what we currently believe now. Right now we have a really negative view of functional outcomes and prognosis for this patient population. So they extrapolated data from the Multi-Society Task Force of 1994 and used the Glasgow Outcome Scale to describe functional outcomes at 12 months post-injury. And they found that 25% of all patients that were in a vegetative state over one month after a traumatic brain injury and over one third of survivors total achieved substantial independence at home and at least partial independence in the community one year post injury. Um, so this just indicates that there is a chance of weight recovery that's better than we currently think and believe. Um, and then this is also what led to that change in definition of persistent vegetative state. So it inc um, increased the time frame um, that we're giving these people a chance for recovery. For those that you miss, it's currently believed that, or it previously was believed, that if they were in a vegetative state one month after their injury, then there probably wasn't a chance of recovery. And now that's been expanded to um, 12 months for a traumatic brain injury and three months for a non-traumatic brain injury. Um, so this is a summary table of the functional um, outcomes that we're looking for. Prognosis for recovery was substantially better for victims with traumatic brain injury than those with a non-traumatic brain injury. They found that older adults, which was defined as more than 40 years old, had worse functional outcomes, really improving beyond the level of severe disability. The rate of recovery and functional outcomes were more favorable for those patients that were in a minimally conscious state versus a vegetative state. Um, and then same for outcomes at one year, it was more favorable for patients in the minimally conscious state versus a vegetative state. So what does this mean for us as a system of care? Currently, patients uh, rarely remain in this high intensity treatment setting long enough for substantial functional improvement. Um, in the US model, which we practice now, um, care for traumatic brain injury and disorders of consciousness provides only a brief interval of intensive special team medical care. So those patients that remain in an unconscious state or her, who even are emerging into a minimally conscious state but it's a really slow evolution, they're typically referred right to a skilled nursing facility or even sent home with family with um, supports in place. So the result of that is they're bypassing specialty rehabilitation and access to specialty care. And then they might even see only see um, a primary care physician once a week, but no organized oversight by a rehab physician who has expertise with brain injury. 
So they're missing all of this um, specialty care by getting sent to a nursing facility or even sent home. Um, there are alternatives to this model that exist. So I found several in the literature. Most of them are not within the United States, and the ones that are in the United States were mostly limited to military personnel. Um, but I put this example in here of models where all patients, regardless of the degree of pace of progress, are admitted for several months to specialized regional brain injury um, rehab facilities. And I put that in there because I think with this paradigm shift and with all this recent literature, you're going to start to see that this becomes, I mean, it will take several years, but I think that eventually this is the way that we'll move towards, and you're going to see a lot more facilities um, that can tailor to this patient population. Okay, so what are we using for interventions in rehab settings? The primary goal in the early phases is to restore communication and ability and independence and self-cares. And this success depends on the recovery of basic neurobehavioral functions mediated by dopamine and other neurotransmitters. Um, and so these networks are responsible for controlling arousal, focusing attention and initiating, as well as sustaining and shifting behavior. So it's really basic skills that we need, or skills that we need for really basic ADLs um, and other sk skills that they're doing. Um, rehab treatments are intended to augment these symptoms. We do this through behavioral, pharmacological, and other means. So I categorize them into three different um, like treatment approaches or interventions. The first one being <coughs> sensory motor regulation, and this is something as therapists is the most feasible or what we're actually getting in there um, targeting or the intervention that we um, are using with these patients. So this promotes recovery by controlling exposure to afferent sensory input or mitigating abnormal motor input. So we're inflicting sensory input to these um, patients in hopes to get some type of motor output. And we do this through structured sensory stimulation. So there are protocols developed out there, but I think honestly it's best to really make a tailored individualized sensory um, stimulation protocol for each patient. And we'll talk about that in upcoming slides on things to consider when doing that. The second intervention is neuromodulation, and this directly alters the physiology of the neuro circuits responsible for mediating behavior, and um, they do this through pharmacological interventions to improve arousal, promote behavioral initiation and persistence, stimulate speech, and to reduce agitation. Um, and I put the, the dopamine agonist that's commonly used is amantadine hydrochloride, and I put this in there because it's the only intervention actually supported by the literature to, um, as an intervention to improve functional recovery. So even above sensory stimulation and everything else that we do, it's the only one that has been found to actually promote functional recovery. And it's in the guidelines that I'll present here in just a minute as well. And then the last one is deep brain stimulation. We don't see this yet much in practice, but um, something to look forward to in the future. All right, so moving on to clinical assessment. This is a huge piece of um, the puzzle when we're doing differential diagnosis and really capturing, again, what level of consciousness they're in and the time frame that they're emerging through those levels because that is so telling for their prognosis of functional recovery. So bedside examination is most commonly used right now. There are specialized behavioral and neuroradiological protocols out there, and these just provide for more specific means of moni monitoring recovery and improve outcome prediction, because they're standardized in structure. Um, with any assessment, there are several assessments out there. I'm gonna speak to um, just one of them, that is the gold <coughs> standard. Uh, but for any assessment that we use, there's two main focuses. The first one is looking at the integrity of the central nervous system particularly the brainstem pathways. So we're looking at, are they getting a pupillary response? Um, do they have ocular movements, oculovestibular reflexes? Are they um, demonstrating breathing patterns or tolerating some breathing on their own, even just for brief um, periods? And then they're also looking at presence of higher level cortical functions, which are the more purposeful and volitional response to stimuli. And so with clinical assessment, we really need to keep in mind that <laughs> repeated assessments and use of standardized evaluations are necessary for um, accurate diagnos diagnoses um, for these patients. Okay, so building the case as to why we need to use standardized assessment. It's consistently 
cited in the literature that between 40 and 41 percent of diagnoses established are incorrect and this is using that bedside examination that is very informal um, and not structured at all and of the 41 percent of these incorrect diagnoses 89 percent were in the false negative direction meaning patients were conscious but believed to be unconscious so you can see what the implications are. You can imagine what the implications are of just having that false diagnosis using a bedside exam. Um, unwarranted pessimism or negativity towards the recovery from disorders of consciousness results in premature withdrawal of care. So uh, doctors, physicians, and family members are misinformed on what the, fun what the literature says on um, functional outcomes or even that they don't think that they're in a vegetative state, but we're missing that because we're not giving them enough, um, or we're not completing these standardized assessments, and that results in premature withdrawal of care. Uh, current healthcare practices exclude patients with disorders of consciousness from active rehabilitation. So standardized assessments are really beneficial for tracking the trends over time and giving us really objective data to support um, their placement in rehab as well as get insurance reimbursement for it. And then, I, I've mentioned this several times, but there's recent studies finding that substantial proportion of these patients eventually <laughs> achieve independence in ADLs, and they also are employable, even. So this just builds the case as to why careful diagnostic assessment and comprehensive multidisciplinary rehab um, should be strongly considered. We need to be getting these patients to a rehab-type setting. This is uh, the practice guideline update for recommendations when working with these, with the patients with disorders of consciousness, and this was just released in 2018. So I would imagine a lot of trauma centers aren't aware of or even implementing um, some of these things that's su suggested by the, the guideline update. And for all of, if I forget to mention it, for all of the articles I've included in my presentation, if you control click, click on the title, you can access this. I just wanted it to be really um, accessible to you all so that today's my last day. Once I'm gone, you guys can continue forward with this conversation and implement some of these things. Uh, the main objectives of the update were to provide care recommendations for patients with prolonged disorders of consciousness and then also redefine the definition of persistent vegetative state um, and the definition of minimally conscious state. And then just some background um, information. Patients with severe TBI who have a disorder of consciousness, um, the hospital mortality was 32% and 70% of those associated were associated with withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy. Uh, withdrawal of care was more closely associated with characteristics like age, sex, pupillary reactivity, Glasgow Coma Scale, motor recovery. So again, going back to those bedside exams and looking only at those traits versus um, doing a standardized assessment to really get a true clinical picture of what their behavioral response is. And then individuals with disorders of consciousness lack staying longer than one month post-injury might still have um, functionally significant recovery after one month <coughs> post-injury. So for all of the guidelines that are proposed or listed, they were given a um, recommendation statement and evidence level. And level A is the strongest recommendation, and this is denoted as we must be implementing this in practice. Level B was um, corresponding to a, sh a verb should, so we should be implementing these in practice, but there's a little bit more flexibility. We use our clinical judgment and um, use this in the right situation. And then level C is the lowest recommendation. Again, um, a still a, a recommendation, but we need to use our clinical judgment and use it in the right um, situation. And then for all of the guidelines, it was um, individuals with the prolonged disorders of consciousness lasting more than 28 days and only of the traumatic brain injury etiology not the non-traumatic, which would be anoxic brain injury, stroke, metabolic disorders, um, and other conditions such as that. Uh, I'll quickly go through these. So table one are recommendation statements for overall care and diagnosis for adults with prolonged disorders of consciousness. And this is saying that um, for patients who achieve medical stability, we need to be referring these patients to rehab settings. So once they're medically stable, 
and we know that the family's pursuing aggressive cares, we need to be making recommendations, whether it's long-term um, care, acute care, or acute rehab, or even a transitional care unit. We need to be thinking what's the next setting for these folks. Um, we need to be using serial standardized neurobehavioral assessments to improve diagnostic evaluation, and I'll speak to one, like I mentioned, um, that's recommended. And then we need to, anytime you do an assessment or an evaluation of um, patients with the disorders of consciousness, we need to attempt to increase their arousal before performing any type of evaluation to really get a true picture of what they're responding to. And then we need to look at and identify any confounding conditions that um, might affect our diagnosis. So a pra do they have apraxia? Do they have aphasia? How can we interact and communicate with these individuals to get the proper response that we are looking for? Let's skip over those. Okay, table two recommendations for prognosis for adults with prolonged disorders of consciousness. So when we're discussing prognosis with caregivers of patients with the disorders of consciousness, during the first 28 days post-injury, we need to avoid any um, negative statements or statements suggesting poor prognosis. So we owe it to these patients at least 28 days to see if they're emerging to a vegetative or even minimally conscious state before we can really make any type of um, prognosis on their functional recovery. Uh, and then we need to, again, perform serial standardized assessments, so just frequently and consistently. Um, the gold standard recommended in the literature is the Coma Recovery Scale Revised, and I'll <coughs> talk about that one here in just a few slides. And then this is the proposed change of the definition permanent vegetative state, so we should stop using that statement and replace it with a chronic vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness. And this is for anyone with a um, vegetative state three months after non-traumatic brain injury or 12 months after a traumatic brain injury. Um, the recommendations for counseling families on prognosis is that we need to counsel them that um, patients with a minimally conscious state or diagnosed with a minimally conscious state within five months of injury and a traumatic etiology ha are associated with more favorable outcomes and folk, or patients with a vegetative state and non-traumatic disorders of consciousness etiology are associated with poor outcomes. But at the end of the day, every individual outcomes vary and prognosis is not universally poor. So we shouldn't just be automatically going to these negative um, or thoughts of poor outcomes. Um, and then the last two recommendations are related to if the patient is determined to have a severe long-term disability, we need to counsel families on different options, whether they seek long-term assistance, um, talking to them about goals of care for their loved one, um, or if they're getting sent home, what type of supports can we give these families. And then the last table, um, recommendation statements for, a care, for care and treatment. Uh, we need to identify patient and family preferences early and then throughout the provision of care, so as they're making progress, or throughout the decision-making process. So are they gonna continue pursuing life-sustaining cares? That really makes a difference on, are we <coughs> recommend them to go to a rehab setting? Um, or what is our plan for therapy? And how can we educate and counsel family? Um, I'm gonna skip those couple. And then this is the recommendation talking about the pharmacological intervention patients with traumatic vegetative state or minimally conscious state between four and 16 weeks post-injury should be prescribed amantadine to hasten functional recovery. So again, that's the only intervention truly found by, um, supported by evidence that improves functional recovery. And then lastly, we just should counsel families about the limitations of the existing evidence um, and tell them that it's impossible to know if any improvements that they're seeing is due to spontaneous recovery or if it's intervention that we're uh, providing and administering to the patient. Uh, so assessment for disorders of consciousness relies on observing behavior and drawing inferences. And currently, again, the um, current standard is using a bedside clinical exam, but this is prone to making inaccurate diagnoses um, which again is consistently in the literature reported as 40 to 41 percent. 
A failure to detect behavioral signs of consciousness might result in premature termination of treatment as well as missed clinical opportunities um, for these patients to get any type of rehabilitation or um, specialty care. Uh, on the opposite spectrum, if we misinterpret these non-purposeful or reflexive behaviors as conscious behavior, it might lead to falsely optimistic prognoses. So we really need to be diligent about determining what's reflexive and what is a purposeful and volitional response because um, that really determines the difference in what level of consciousness they are, which at the end of the day tells us uh, more information about their long-term outcome. Um, okay, I just wanted to point out here, conscious behaviors, behaviors are often subtle and inconsistent, so they have to be carefully differentiated from reflexive or random behavior. So to, to determine a minimally conscious state from a vegetative state, we look for evidence of one or more of the following. If they can follow simple commands, um, if they provide a gestural or verbal yes-no response, if there's any intelligible verbalization or movements that occur in relation to relative stimuli that are not reflexive. Um, those, it, an evidence of any one of those shows that they're in a minimally conscious state. So for example, we had a gentleman the other day that um, demonstrated movements that was very um, volitional and purposeful. His wife was speaking in the back corner and he quickly moved his eyes to localize to her voice, and that was a very purposeful and volitional movement. It wasn't um, a reflexive behavioral response. So that demonstrated that he was in more of a minimally conscious state. He was also saying yes, no, and following simple commands, but that was one thing telling us he was in a minimally conscious state. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the importance of standardized assessments um, for this patient population, but what assessment should we be doing? Um, Coma Recovery Scale Revised is the gold standard <coughs> cited in, uh, in the literature, and this consists of 23 hierarchically arranged items divided into six subscales. So we're assessing auditory, visual, motor, oromotor, communication, and arousal functions, and each of those um, functions, or each of those categories, there's a uh, scale and the lowest item on the scale represents reflexive behavior, and the highest level on the scale reflects cognitively mediated behavior or more volitional and purposeful behaviors. Um, and so th there is a systematic review looking at all the different types of assessments out there for this population, and this was the only assessment that met all criteria for accessibility, standardization, and interpretive guidelines. It was found to have excellent excellent content validity, so items can differentiate a person who's in a vegetative state versus a minimally conscious state. Um, and there's good iterator reliability, meaning that multiple people can administer this <coughs> assessment and come up with the same results each time. Um, so we've talked about assessment, now moving on to intervention. And for therapy, this is mostly um, sensory stimulation, so I'm just gonna spend some time talking about how we can provide sensory stimulation and what the evidence says about this. Um, so some background on sensory stimulation. Sensory stimuli is used to evaluate and restore cognitive functions and consciousness in patients with disorders of consciousness. So it's based on the idea that in enriched environment, benefits brain plasticity and improves recovery. It was found to change cortical thickness, change neuron size, and the number and connection, so neuroplasticity. There is a lack of scientific evidence supporting this in human subjects. However, the theory and the thought of, behind it um, in, is that it enhances rehabilitative process by avoiding environmental deprivation and promoting synaptic reinnervation, which this results in accelerating recovery. So even if we haven't found that sensory stim promotes recovery, we know that it's humanistic to have stimulation. We live in a very um, high, what do you wanna call it? Very, yeah, multi-sensory world, and we're always taking in and interpreting stimulation. So um, the thought is that at the least, we're avoiding environmental deprivation to these folks. We have to at least provide them something to respond to, some sort of stimulation. Um, let's get that. 
Okay, this was a systematic review that looked at um, the effectiveness of sensory stimulation to improve, improve arousal and alertness. And they found that there's strong evidence that multimodal sensory stimulation improves arousal and enhances clinical outcomes. So we know that we have several means of interpreting sensory information. And so multimodal sensory stimulation is just referring to um, targeting several of those, those means of interpreting stimulation. So for example, um, this morning we had PT, OT, and speech working with a gentleman who just recently emerged into a minimally conscious state. And so he was sitting up getting some proprioceptive and vestibular input as well as um, I had him I'd hand over hand washing his face or holding onto his picture board. He was getting visual stimuli, looking at familiar photos. Speech was providing oral stimulation. So we're really providing all means of stimulation um, in hopes to get some type of behavioral response. And the outcome was he was very much more alert and aroused given all those means of stimulation. There was moderate evidence that auditory stimulation, especially in the form of a familiar voice, increases arousal. So when I go in with these patients, I'm educating their family, uh, getting them involved, um, speaking to their loved one. This particular gentleman is very responsive to his wife, uh, more so than any of the therapists, which kind of supports this concept here. Um, so involving family as much as possible, educating them that familiar voices increases arousal as well as music. Music, music has been found in the literature to also increase arousal. So I've educated families on um, playing some of their favorite type of music in the background for brief periods of time during the day um, just to increase their arousal and alertness. There was limited evidence about the complexity of stimuli being more important than the intensity. Okay, so implications for, for practice, what can we take away from this? Is that sensory simulation protocols should be begin early, they should be frequent, so three to five times a day for approximately 20 minutes. And then it should be sustained until more complex activity is possible. So you're probably thinking how on earth is therapy gonna achieve this three to five times a day goal? And this is where we really educate family if they're involved on appropriate ways to provide <coughs> sensory simulation um, using familiar voices, orienting the patient. So it sometimes is uncomfortable for family members to talk to these patients because they're not responding and that can be a little uncomfortable sometimes. So educating them on orienting the patient every day and frequently, um, kind of narrating their story or if there's anything going on in the news or if there's anything that they love, like if they love sports, maybe giving an update on any sporting events going on. And then um, also educating nursing or CNAs on how they can help as well. Reach that three to five times a day for 20 minutes. It's also important to note giving them plenty of rest breaks. So after you provide sensory stim, then giving them periods for their brains to restore and recover. Um, so shutting the lights down, having visitors step out for a, few, for a while, um, really periods of low stimulation. This is an article that looked at using personally relevant stimuli um, with patients and seeing if that makes a difference. And what they found is that using personally relevant stimuli is associated with enhanced behavioral responses um, compared to irrelevant or neutral stimuli. So our occupational profile is most important or very important in working with this patient population, really talking with family, learning what their preferences are, what are their, what's their daily routine looking like, um, what are meaningful everyday things that they do and incorporating all of those things into the session. So for example, uh, they're a big sports fan and they like basketball, bringing a basketball in and getting that familiar input into their hands um, or baseball or whatever. ADLs are inherently really meaningful, salient um, activities that are very familiar to all of us. So even if it's hand over hand, max assist to wash face, wash hands or do oral cares, um, that's all really familiar and meaningful tasks to them in, in hopes that that'll increase their behavioral response. Uh, this is looking at do sensory stimulation programs have an impact on consciousness? And what they found is that it may not be sufficient to restore consciousness, um, but it did result in higher coma recovery scale scores um, when implementing a sensory stim protocol versus period, a period of time where they provided no sensory stimulation. And they also found that it was 
it led to more improved behavioral responsiveness in patients with a minimally conscious state versus a vegetative state. So in combination with other therapeutics like pharmacological intervention, um, they concluded that it might optimize their recovery. I'm gonna skip over this one, but this just talks about really all the different factors that I've already talked about. The complexity, frequency, um, how much stimulation we should be provide and using uh, familiar and meaningful stimulation within your sensory stim protocol. Uh, I wanted to leave time to get to this, so I'm not an expert in this. Oh no. Okay. I'm going to steal, I have a printed copy of it. I'll go old school here. Um, I'm not an expert with this, um, working with these patients as I have minimal experience, but I have a mentor from one of my clinical rotations that is an expert in this patient population and she's very involved with the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine. And so I called her and interviewed her after I reviewed the literature. I had some questions of just really practical and functional questions on if with all this information, how are we actually gonna implement this in practice and what would that look like? Um, so this is from Brooke Murtaugh. She's the brain injury program manager at both Omaha and Lincoln facilities. And a message from her to start is that there is a paradigm shift currently happening for how we care for patients with disorders of consciousness. You're gonna start to see changes to practice over the next several years. We need to stop pulling the plug on these patients, start assessing them appropriately, and implementing a rehab first initiative. So she was just saying that no matter what the MRI looks like, we have no clue what the functional outcome will be, and the odds are in the patient's favor. So we need to give them the opportunity at a good quality of life. So she's just really advocating, and we need to be on board too, of advocating for these patients um, to get rehabilitation after they leave the acute care setting. Um, so one question I asked her is regarding sedation and how this might affect a patient's ability to demonstrate a behavioral response um, if they're on, on any sedatives and if we should be working with nursing on trying to wean them from sedatives or working with them during a period of time where they're not provided um, sedation. So her recommendation was that we need to be looking at the chart. If they're in a medically induced coma or if they have any paralytics or sedatives, then um, it really won't do us any good to assess their behavioral responses because they're not gonna give us a full behavioral response. Um, then we look at any confounding factors like morphine, Ativan, Keppra, or any other um, pain medication that might <laughs> affect their ability to respond. Um, without, if they don't have any of these confounding factors, then we need to start assessing right away as soon as possible and frequently um, using preferably the coma recovery scale, but there are lots of assessments out there. And the overall goal is to start delineating where they are on the spectrum um, so that we can make good recommendations moving forward. And then we should be in close communication with nursing. So I was talking to Kylie, I think there's a period of time they take patients off sedation each day or try to. So really having close communication with nursing and assessing during those periods. Um, my other question, that I'll just kind of pick and choose what questions I talk about. Uh, how do we advocate for these patients? So when we're talking to physicians and trauma rounds, or when we're talking to the family, what should we really be saying to advocate for prolonged care, getting them to the next rehabilitation setting? And so really, the general prognosis should be discussed early on from the physician. And if at that time family decides to pursue care, like getting a trach and pay, we can't, that implies that they're wishing to pursue life-sustaining cares. Um, and it doesn't have to be a forever decision. It could be just right then in that moment, acutely, that they decide that. And if that's the case, then that's when we start going in and educating on um, sensory stimulation and what we're looking for. And as they start to emerge, um, advocating for them to go to a rehabilitation type setting. So, um, let me see what else. Did. Oh, and another thing to educate family on is even if they continue to decide aggressive cares, it doesn't have to be forever. So some families might give themselves six months, um, and if the, or some families might give themselves a year, and if the patient isn't progressing as planned, or if they've decided they've had enough of this, or the patient wouldn't want to live with this quality of life, at that time they can start de-escalating cares. 
Um, they can take away two feedings or discuss comfort cares, or there's lots of options based on the patient situation. Um, so making sure families know that up front when they're making their decision. And then lastly, I think I just want to mention um, some next steps. Let me see if I can get this one. I put together a decision tree for you guys, just like as a quick reference when deciding what to do with these patients, and I put that, I've linked that here as well. But the last thing I just want to say is some next steps moving forward. So. Um, our new neuro fellow Stephanie will be starting here in just a few days and so maybe just working as a team how you can get these guidelines um, starting this conversation with the physicians and and educating them on the guidelines and how that um, they can work with therapy to help in the decision-making process and if you're interested in this topic and want some continuing education you can follow American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine um, they're going to have several conferences in the upcoming years on continued education for assessment, intervention, and discharge recommendations, as well as posting more research um, and competencies on their website. And then Brooke Marcel wanted me to pass along if you guys are interested in getting more training on using the Coma Recovery Scale or how to work with these patients. She's more than willing to come in to do a in-service, and you can just contact Madonna, the Madonna Nurse Liaison Alexis Simon if you're familiar, someone will can put you into contact with her. So that is all I have. I've linked a bunch of resources in here, like a case study, which I probably won't be able to click on. Um, working with the gentleman that we've been doing the coma recovery scale on, and just kind of going through my thought process applying the guidelines while working with him. So if you're interested in having that, all of this will be on the shared drive eventually. Um, so you guys can just click on the links and access all my resources that way. If you have any questions, feel free to stick around. I'll try to do my best to answer them. Or... And come sign in here. You can yeah. get continuing education credit for attending, and there's a handout if you guys didn't already get it. Thank you guys for coming and taking our lunch. Oh. <laughs>